Um, last time, I hadn't a voice. <laughs> well, uh, my voice is back now of a kind, um, and it allows me to, to welcome Chris Atkins. Now, Chris is, um, as you know, a very um, interesting documentary filmmaker. He made his first documentary, Taking Liberties, and it had a book accompanying it, and it really made an incredible impression, showed in 100 cinemas around the country. I remember seeing it. Wow, what's that doing on cinema? Um, it was an amazing film about the attacks by Blair and Co. on liberties in this country, warning about the possibility of a sort of Orwellian state. I know that because I've seen the Wikipedia. Have you seen the Wikipedia on that film? I haven't, no. It's I really should, good. I should check it out. Absolutely yeah, terrific. You could become an expert on your film. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. Um, everybody involved in it is listed. Oh, right. Yeah, everybody. No, do me. Yeah. I'll just put um, me up. <laughs> so, go to Wikipedia. Taking liberties. Uh, BAFTA nominations, the whole lot. Well, what was to be the second film? Well, even more sensational. Two front pages in The Guardian. Great title, Star Suckers, you can't forget that. Um, and I think uh, Chris is going to show excerpts from his films. I don't want to spoil the, the fun. Basically, um, the media dumbing down, obsession with celebrity. If anyone's proven the case, um, it's Chris Atkins through his very exciting documentary work. He's also uh, done a film about um, an urban fox hunting tribe, which also tricked various very eminent uh, media. And so, with that kind of history, aren't we pleased to see Chris here? Yeah, let's welcome. I should say we're doing it differently today. Chris is going to talk, show a film, and then... Uh, invite questions rather than speak for 40 minutes and then questions. Yes. Yeah, that's probably best, I think. Thank you all for having me. Um, I'm going to stand here because I'm being streamed live to millions of people, I've been told. So, yes, I need to yeah. plonk myself here. I'm also quite excited to be in the Department of Criminology uh, <laughs> today. Um, I'm not quite sure how many laws we break to make this film, but it's quite a few. Um, so, uh, yes, this film, Star Suckers, uh, that I made. Um, God, when did I even start doing it? I think sort of 2007 I first got the idea for it. So yes, they're quite a uh, painfully long, long project. Um, so the best way I could sum up Star Suckers was I, w I work in media and I've worked in media at that point for about eight, nine years. And there was to me a huge gulf between how I viewed the media from, from the inside working in it and, and how the media presented itself to, to, to the public. Um, so, the, the, and it's specifically journalism. Journalism was the, 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 the big problem for me, that, that presenting them, themselves in the media. Um, journalists were almost uh, uh, putting themselves above the law as people who uh, reported facts and searched for truth and, and helped you, the public, understand something more about the world. And I suppose growing up, that, that's what I thought that the media and journalism was, was there to do. But... Working on it from the inside, and I was a film producer before I was a documentary uh, maker, so I, I, I kind of got to see a lot of different bits of it. Would see that the media was essentially just doing one thing. It was a, it was a celebrity delivery device. That, that, that that's all it was, and that was all it was, it was set up to do. And and that fascinated me because I thought, it, you know, the, the media is just lying to the public, and it's lying to the public in a way that no one else would get away with. Because if, if politicians lie to the public, they get rumbled by the media quite a lot of the time. If, if an oil company is lying to the public, they get rumbled by the media. But if the media is lying to the public, no one's going to rumble them. Okay, there's this kind of omerta, sort of code of silence that you don't, you know, dog doesn't eat dog. Um, so I thought, you know, I was looking around for a subject for my next documentary, and I saw that no one was doing this. No one was really going hammer and tongs after the media. So I thought, well, why don't we just do that? And why don't we try and explain to people this, this discrepancy, um, really? So the film set out to, to, to do various things. It was to, to look at the harm 
that the celebrity delivery was was having on the public um and it was also to expose who benefits from that who's 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 profiting from that and we we looked at a number of areas we looked at the the, the harm um it, it, it had on children so i created uh, a fake uh, reality tv company uh the, the, and some fake reality tv shows for children um and one of them was called baby boozers okay we went to a shopping center and we said to parents we've, we've got the show called baby boozers would you like to sign your children up for that we will if they if they're successful they will get to drink a different kind of alcohol e each week and we'll test the effect that it has on their liver and the parents went, oh yeah yeah magnificent yeah yeah, yeah. and so <laughs> that and uh, so, so that the, 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 there was that one, and we 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 moved through various sort of chapters. We looked at kids. Um, I looked at charity, and we had a whole section on Bob Geldof. But the, the the one the one that got us all the attention, the one that suddenly took this from being a, a weird little film about psychology of celebrity, which is what it was, and suddenly took us onto the front pages, was when we started attacking the media, we started t attacking celebrity journalists. So I wanted to see what level of truth there was in celebrity journalism. It was a simple question. Um, and if you talk to celebrity journalists, they'll say that every story of theirs is fact-checked and double-sourced. And if you see people like Gordon Smart, who's the bizarre editor in The Sun, if you see him interviewed on the telly, he acts like he's John Pilger. That's how good his journalism is. Um, so I thought, well, let's, let's just test this out. Let's just test out how much truth there is in celebrity journalism. So this, this little clip here, I mean, it got so much attention and got us in so much trouble. But this clip I'm going to show you is about three minutes long but it shows you uh, it shows you how that test worked out okay now let's see if this works scene two okay. it may or may not work isn't it? Didn't realise quite how successful shutting us up. Okay, 
we didn't realize quite how sex, successful that was going to be. That's the thing with hoaxes. You kind of just try these things and they can either kind of fall on their ass or they can kind of do what happened there. So the, the story wouldn't just go into one newspaper. The story would go into the mirror, but then other newspapers would read that and go, oh, it must be true, it's in the mirror. And they would copy the story and put it in their newspaper. Then other people would put it in their newspaper. And it would go around the world. So the, the Amy Hare fire story ended up in the Times of India, which is the largest read English-speaking newspaper in the world. Um, the Star, when it got hold of the story, they added their own details to it. So they added the fact that um, one of Amy's friends came in and punched her in the head to put out the blaze. And we, we didn't even say that. The Sun made up quotes. You saw all these quotes in the Sun that we didn't say. We recorded our conversations. Like, well, we didn't say that. So this whole thing of people inventing quotes was, uh, uh, was, was, was quite interesting to see. Um, the, the, the Guardian were very good because we told the Guardian about this and they were like, brilliant, brilliant. And they put the story of us doing that on the front page of the Guardian. But when we got it, and it was brilliant, it was like amazing advanced publicity for the film, but they had it next to a huge, huge photo of Amy Winehouse, which to me was like, it was just wonderfully ironic. So I was like, we're making a film that criticises there being too much celebrity in the media. And now the Guardian got to put a photo of Amy Winehouse on the front page. It's just like, you know, make the problem uh, worse. Um, the, the, the tabloids did get quite angry. They're, they've still to this day have refused to debate in public with me. I did lots of radio and TV interviews about this. And they never, we never once got anyone from any tabloid to actually come and actually debate against me. They won't. They just pull down the shutters, no comment, no comment, ignore it, hope it goes away. Um, but they did send um, some tabloids, some journalists did come around to my house. They did send some hacks to doorstep me. Um, but unfortunately, they went to the wrong house. <laughs> Um, they, they went to my old house where my ex-girlfriend still lives and anyway so and I think it just does go to show that tabloid journalists don't check their facts but um, and and then it, it, we spent we spent about three weeks on that specific stunt we actually were quite obsessed with it um, and we learned all these little tips like when to call up what to say what name to give all, all that sort of thing what papers like which stories more so when the film came out and we, we, we had a website for the film because everyone has a website for the film I put on the website um, a guide of, of how to sell a fake news story, and it's still up there. It's starsuckersmovie.com. It's how to sell a fake news story. Um, and and I, I kind of forgot about it because so much else was going on with the film. But months later, after the film was on telly, I started getting these emails through the website from students going, we've seen your film, we're skin. So we called up the Daily Star and sold them a fake story, and they've just given us 300 quid. Thank you very much. And I was like, brilliant. So anyway, we, I then did a follow-up story with The Independent about all these students who are essentially funding their way through university uh, by selling rubbish to the sun. So it's like a big society in action. But um, uh, So that, that, that's all the stuff about the fake story. So I'll move on to the next section. Does anyone have any questions about that? Any questions about any of those stuff? Yeah, it does. It does. I mean, I would do it. I would do it, but... You yeah, I mean, it, it, we, we didn't take any money for it because it was it, it, journalistic ethics and all that sort of nonsense. And my lawyers had to sit through and go, no, no, you can't take money for it. But yeah, absolutely. And I, I get emails even like the last one was like two months ago from students going, yeah, just do it. But the problem is they don't have time to get their own stories. And reality is quite dull. This is the problem for tabloids. It, it, celebrities are quite boring people. And they often don't do anything very interesting. And they have pages to fill. In most tabloids, they've got two gossip column pages every single day to put something new and exciting, crazy and wacky and funny about the world of celebrity. And if it's a Monday, so, so, so celebrities normally go out midweek. They don't go out weekend. So Monday's a nightmare day for them. Because they're sitting there with two pages to fill. I don't know if it's making notes. Um, so Monday's a nightmare day. And if you call up at about 2 o'clock, they don't have time to check it because they're cut off four. And at two o'clock as well, they're sitting going, we haven't got anything, we haven't got anything. And they pay. The problem is for them is they pay. And if you go in with the truth, they'll go, that's not very interesting and not pay very much money. But if you go in with some really hilarious bullshit, they will go, oh, that's really, really funny and pay you more. So it's this weird logic that the less true it is, the more likely they are to print it, the more money they're going to give you. So yes, absolutely, call them up. Go, I've got this, the guide on the website, but just the, the numbers are in the papers. Call them up. The worst thing they can do is not print it. But the best thing they can do is give you 300 quid for some nonsense. So go for it. There you go. They hate me. They hate me so much for saying it. <laughs>
Any, anyone else? Any questions? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, sorry. Um, does that mean, for example, that the Sun did the same thing with like politicians, like Labour politicians, um, because obviously the Sun changed its stance to Conservative? So you could sort of say that they made up all this sort of stuff about politicians in order to get the public to vote for yeah. Conservatives. And stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, you've really hit that. was a really important point I was going to say, but I forgot. But yes, the, the, the problem with this is... People say to me, look, it's just gossip. It's just the celebrity tip and the tittle-tattle. What's the problem with this? And, and that's a fair point. If it only stayed on the celebrity pages, the problem is, is celebrity journalism and the celebrity style of reporting and the celebrity journalists themselves don't just stay on the gossip column pages. If you look at a certain chap called Andy Coulson, you want to know Andy Coulson? Yeah. Where, where was his first job? Anyone know? Bizarre column of the sun. Gossip columns. Okay. Uh, Piers Morgan. Absolutely the same. Celebrity journalist. He was very, very successful. He was appointed editor, I think, of, this, of the News of the World when he was 27. Okay. And all he'd done before that was be a very successful celebrity journalist where he just made shit up like this. He was then very quickly moved into edit the mirror where he edited the mirror for 10 years and he got fired. Why did he get fired? Because of a nonsense story about British soldiers abusing Iraqi prisoners. It wasn't true. The photos were bollocks. As soon as I saw those photos, you could see from the lighting source that it was set up. And because he's a crap journalist, because he learned his trade on the celebrity pages. So it's the same journalists who are writing about Amy's hair one day, the next day they're writing about weapons of mass destruction, the next day they're choosing which party to back in the general election. The editor of The Sun today is a guy called Dominic Mohan. I know him, he follows me on Twitter. I have no idea why, <laughs> but he follows me on Twitter. Um, Dominic Mohan ran the bizarre column in The Sun, printing stories like this for years. And that's the problem. Things like fabricated quotes, a source said, a friend said. That you could never, you never used to be able to do that in political journalism. You were not allowed to do that. You had to know who said that quote and stand it up. Now everyone goes, sources close to the Prime Minister said, and they're just making up the quotes. So it's like a, it's like a virus. It's, it's, it's gone out and infected everyone. We've all got brought down to the level. Uh, but yes, no, it's a, it's a very good point. It, it, it's, it's the celebrity journalists who go on to run national newspapers that is our, 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 our big problem. A tabloid, or has it spread into a Yeah, it's terrifying. The thing, I mean, it, and that's really where the silver bullet should go because I don't have so. There's only so much you can knock the sun. Because you know, it's the sun, you know. You kind of know that, really. I mean, they've got like millions of readers, and they say they can influence elections. I don't think they can, but they think they can, and politicians think they can. But at the end of the day, it's just the sun. But when you see the same style of reporting going into the Guardian and into the Times and the Telegraph and these really pompous news organisations that really should know better and think that they are somehow above all this when they start doing it as well. It's just as, it's just as deadly. And the crucial one, a point on this, when I did my story for The Guardian, I gave some, I'm always giving quotes that I regret, but I gave a quote saying exactly that. It's not just the tabloids. It's all news outlets. And they're particularly prone to using other newspapers as a source of truth. So rather than going, that story's in the sun, where do they get that? Let's go to the source. People go, that story's in the sun, let's just print that story again. And the problem with that is if the sun's wrong, it means everyone else is wrong. And I said that everyone is prone to this, including The Guardian, because I was doing an interview in The Guardian, I thought it was good to say, it would collect responsibility. And, and, and as a throwaway comment, I said, and Channel 4 News, okay. It was on The Guardian front page. That morning, phone goes to my lawyers and it's Channel 4 News it's lawyers going, what's Chris Atkins saying about us? They're saying that we print stuff that isn't true. And I had this ongoing legal route with Channel 4 News. They wanted me to apologise, they wanted the Guardian to print a retraction, but they basically said, you know, we don't print stuff that isn't true. And I said, well, you must have done, you must have run a story that turned out not to be true because you ran it on a newspaper. When, 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 when. This legal route was going on. And then the next day, the balloon boy thing happened. Does everyone remember the balloon boy? Yeah, which they ran as like a lead story. And funnily enough, the lawyers called stopped immediately after that. And that was even nothing to do with it. But it was just, uh, just saying, because they were saying, we've got this news feed from America, there's this balloon in the air with this boy trapped in. And of course he wasn't. So, yeah, exactly. It, it's all news outlets that are, that are, that are prone to this. And it's, and it's the 24-hour cycle. And that's the problem. You don't have the time to check facts. Because you've got, and I do stories with The Guardian, and I've been there with the news editor coming and going, 
come on, it's got to be online now, it's got to be online now. And okay, it wasn't that we didn't get time to check the facts, but it's like you can feel that pressure. And it's not his fault, it's not the newspaper's fault, it's just this world we're in. That, that the only value news thinks it has is by being first. And by being first, you've got to get it out immediately. If you do that, you, you don't get time. I suppose you interviewed uh, Nick Davies there. Did you bring that yes. up with him? Yeah. Because yeah. he's done his own kind of uh, book about how... Oh, Flat Earth News, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Flat Earth News that inspired us. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Back, um, did you uh, uh, mention the propaganda model by uh, Chomsky and Herman? Because that kind of it basically looks into it in depth with yeah, 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 yeah. Flat Earth News about... Well, I think, I think uh, the, the problem with all this... I think propaganda is really too point. The problem with all this, I know it's slightly off where I was going to go, but it's PR that when you have this massive need for news and you don't have resources to go out and, and report it and get stories and check facts, if you have these people coming with a press release and you go, oh, here we are, here's, here's a nice little uh, story for you, oh, look, it's all written up and here's all these quotes and here's all these photos, and don't worry, no one's going to see it because it's us trying to plug a product, then propaganda and PR just fills the void. And that's why over half of the news is PR. There's a guy coming next week called uh, Martin Moore from the Media Standards Trust to talk about exactly that journalism and PR. And uh, he's set up his whole website. Anyway, so come next week to talk to Martin because he knows what to do. Thanks for the plan. There you go. <laughs> um, but um, no, no, do come. Right, so on to the next thing. The, the, the other angle, there's all this nonsense being made up and all people not checking their facts. And then on the other side of the equation, we looked at the media model and thought, you know, these guys really think they are above the law. Um, I mean, like, quite literally, they're going out and they're breaking the law and no one's stopping them. Now, you are allowed in the world of journalism and media uh, to do things that are a bit underhand if there's no other way of getting the information and it is in the public interest for you to go out and do what we did. So we basically made, we, that, that was a little bit naughty. We made up stories, we got them printed, but it was in the wider public interest to show that journalists don't check their facts. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> me. Um, but what we were finding, and what of course is now blowing up now massively, um, it's like our own, it's like Watergate with celebrities, isn't it? It's the, it's the phone hacking stuff. So, but at the time, this is in 2008, basically there was Nick Davis and a couple of other people banging on about this, but it was just being ignored. No one was reporting on it, no one was taking it seriously. But the fact was, is you have tabloids, not so much the daily tabloids, because they haven't got the time or the resources, but the weekly tabloids, the Sunday red tops were, as a matter of, of, print, of, of uh, policy, breaking the law on a regular basis. And no one was stopping them. No one was exposing it. And of course, no investigative journalist is going to go and do that because it's no journalists don't wrap on their own. So I wanted to set up a little test. I wanted to set up a little survey of the Red Tops to see if they were given the opportunity, which ones of them would break the law. Okay. And again, we just really, really didn't know what we were letting ourselves in for. But essentially, we did like a a News of the World sting on the News of the World, uh, which they were really, really not happy with at all. So um, I'm just going to show you this, this little clip. Yeah. You can write stuff down. What? Me recording? Yeah. Just. You know, 
things about undercover is you go in wanting one thing which is to get them all to offer me money for medical records which is what they did but in the middle of it she suddenly comes out with this whole line saying oh the PCC is a load of rubbish <laughs> oh god can't <laughs> wait to tell the Guardian this um, so uh, in some ways I, I think that, that the reaction to the media is kind of some, some ways more interesting than the actual stuff in the film itself because they don't like being attacked that's the thing. They're not used to being attacked. They're not very good at being attacked. They don't normally get attacked. So, it, 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 the, the Sunday Mirror and the people both just ignored us. They just said no comment, no comment, and that was it. The News of the World literally said we're extremely upset that Chris Atkins has, has invaded our privacy. Um, <laughs> so proud of that. And they tried to set about suing us. Because we put that out into the public domain via The Guardian like two weeks before the film was released. You know, it's like advanced publicity. Um, and they, we suddenly started getting like, all these legal letters coming in. Like literally every day there was a different team of lawyers representing the news of the world trying different things to try and shut the, the, the film down. They, they were literally trying to stop us releasing the film because they just didn't, didn't want to be criticised publicly. Um, and so they threatened us with libel and defamation suits, even though they've gone before Parliament and said our libel defamation laws are way too tough because it stops them printing about celebrities having sex. Um, they, they tried to get an advanced screening of the film. They wanted a private screening for News of the World executives and their lawyers before we released the film. And we said to them, do you give any of your subjects advanced copy 
of the articles you're writing about them? Do you still have you're turning over Max Mosley? Do you fax him a copy that's okay with him? No, you just print the damn thing. Um, and they also wanted um, all the transcripts of all the undercover co recording conversations, not just of her, but like of the film in general. So we could hand them over all this evidence in which they could try and sew it with. And we said, has it like the 30 year history of the news of the world? Have you ever done that ever? No, it's privileged journalistic material. Um, so this kept on and kept on and kept on. And we fortunately had a very, very, very good law firm who actually quite enjoyed the fight. And in the end we said, look, no, we are going to put this in cinemas. If you want to take us to court, take us to court. And we put it in cinemas and didn't hear anything from them. Um, but anyway, it just amused me that the very people who use sort of freedom of the... Tabloids use freedom of the press. They, they, they use free speech to, to, to make money by lying. That's, that's how I see it. The second you kind of turn the tables on them, they use every trick at their disposal to try and stop them saying what it is you want to say. Um, right, so any questions about that? Um, no, no, again, that's what the News of the World said to us, and we said, when have you ever blanked out anyone's <laughs> so it's like, when have you ever done that? Um, so I'll, I'll stop response. No, I mean, there, there was a lot of discussion about that, and in a lot of, in some undercover stings, you'll see people's face blank, blanked out. Um, and in, in the fake stories, in the, in, the, in the tabloid hoaxes, we didn't name any of the journalists at all, because it was like, whatever poor buggers on the news desk that day. With this one, we thought, no, this is, they're all breaking the PTC code. If those medical documents had been real, they'd have all been breaking the law. So it's almost a way of shooting a salvo across the bowels of tabloid journalists, saying, look, we won't anonymize you. If you're going to do stuff, I might do this again in three years. You know, we will nail you. So the next time you think of breaking the law, think, hang on, maybe it's this Chris Atkins with a camera, or someone else with a camera. So, yeah, it was, it, it, it was a tough one, but I thought because they had, they personally had breached PCC guidelines and would have broken the law, then we thought, name and shame. Um, I believe, no, Nick Owens is still at the Sunday Mirror. Um, and uh, the News of the World girl, I haven't seen her byline, and I know that one of the people didn't get a job. She, I think she was freelance and wasn't hired again. So, yeah, they, that, that's, that's the way of the world. Yeah, yeah. How come the tabloids didn't use the excuse of um, basically that, oh, we, we didn't realise that they were following the PCC codes? Well, that, was, that would have been an exciting, uh, yeah, an interesting uh, excuse. Yeah, the guy at the Express put the phone, but the guy at the Sunday Express did exactly the same thing. Because he, we, as soon as he heard medical records, as soon as he heard that thing, an alarm bell went in his head and he said, I cannot touch this with a barge pole. There are some breaches of the Data Protection Act that are allowed if it's justified in the public interest. Okay, I'll give you an example. MPs' expenses. Massive breach of the Data Protection Act. Stole a CD. All those MPs' private details. And when the people, and actually people in Parliament go, oh, you've got to call the police and someone stole a CD. <laughs> and the police looked at it and said, there isn't a judge or jury in the land that's going to stand this up because these people have all been ripping us off. So in that case, they breached the Data Protection Act. So you can breach... If you knew that Gordon Brown um, had taken a £1 million fee from the Royal Bank of Scotland, I hate to add that he didn't, by the way, but if, if he had, the day before that he gave the state bailout, that's bribery on a massive scale, huge corruption and everything else. If the only way you could get that evidence was by hacking his bank account, you hacked his bank account, you got that evidence, that would be okay as a journalist. Now, not if you were just fishing. Not if you were hacking all politicians' bank accounts all the time, so you'd happen to see that. You'd need prima facie evidence that that was happening. You'd have to try every other way of getting it. But if the only way of getting it, of a story that massive, was hacking his bank account, I believe you'd be okay. Now, where we were with this was health and medical. And Paul Dacre has said, head of the Editors' Committee on the PCC, he himself said in the House of Commons, medical records are off limits, completely out of bounds. There is no instance where a celebrity's health record could be deemed to be in the public. And that's, that's why we used it, because we knew it was a trap. We knew that anyone offering money for health records in any circumstance was going to be an absolute no-no. The News of the World tried to say it. The News of the World tried to say, oh, well, we said it was all in the public interest. And we said to them, how can Ricky Gervais's nose job be in the public interest? It's really interesting to the public, but it's not enough of a public interest to nick his medical record.
but yeah no it's a fine it's a it's a complicated area but we would we would sort of yeah we won the argument because they tried to do us a lot um, anyone else okay well the next thing i want to talk about is public relations which we kind of talked about a bit then and the whole journalism thing is going to come up next week journalism if you don't know is this thing of cutting and pasting press releases okay um and there's a website that's been set up in order to counteract that there's a guy coming next week to talk about that that's not the public relations I was most interested in at the time when I made Star Set. The public relations I was most interested in at the time was PR actually has morphed away from selling good news to stopping bad news getting out. Okay. The public relations for, for people, when you're on the up as a celebrity, when you're in a boy band and you want to get your singing in the charts, your PRs will be out there selling any old crap about you just to get your name in the paper. And you'll never see, because you need your net exposure out there. But the, the the dynamic is is once you kind of get to the top, you then need to kind of be squeaky clean and start appealing to families and middle brown newspapers. In which case, you don't want all this nastiness coming out about you. So once people reach the top, you'll find that they start suing a lot more over the details in their private life. But more importantly than that, they will hire very very powerful public relations figures in order to quash stories. And there's one guy in particular who's better than this than anyone else. Thank you very much. So we thought, you know, we're going to do something about the evils of PR. We've got to go for Max Clifford. There's just, like, there's just no one else. There's other people who are a bit like him. Other people are a bit as nasty as him. We thought we've just got, we've just got to go for Max. We've got to turn over Max. So we, we, we turned over Max. So let me, um, let me show you this bit. And he was really unhappy about it. <laughs> people normally ask me is the beeping why do we beep those names out um, I mean I was obviously there I was actually doing doing the recording um, and so I know what he said but the problem was when we sat down with the lawyers and the lawyers said okay how can you back this up what he's saying how can you back up that X is sexually harassing teenagers and that Y is paying people to sit around him in a cinema and sort of this videotape exists and all this stuff and we said well we've just got Max's say so and the lawyer said well unfortunately libel law being what it is in britain you if that goes out it's not max you have to worry about it's those very 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 powerful people and if they come and sue you you have to it's not up to them to prove it's not true it's up to you to prove it's true and the only evidence i've got is the ramblings of max clifford and there's no way that he is going to come and take the stand in my defense to stack this up so unfortunately we did have to we did have to beat those names out how people also say, how did, how did you get in? How did, how did you get in to interview Max? And 
that was absolutely terrifyingly easy. That was that was like the, the most easiest thing we did in the whole documentary, because Max, it was. I always ask at the start. There's there's one publicist who everyone knows, Max Clifford. Everyone knows him. The reason everyone knows him is he's on the telly the entire time. Okay, remember when Jay died? It was literally Max TV. He was on every single side, um, and he does that because it, it gets his face out. It gets his name out. So if any of you happen to see a footballer taking drugs in a toilet or whatever, and you think Oh, I've got a story. Who are you going to call? Max Lifford. So for the public, he is the man who gets you money for your stories. So that's why he's on telly the entire time. But to be on telly the entire time, he has to say yes to anyone who asks to interview him. So when we called him up saying, hi, Max, we want to interview you about a documentary for celebrity culture. True. He said, yeah, yeah, sure, come around at 10 o'clock. He also loves it. He loves the cameras. He would literally talk to cameras. All Some days he does talk to, to, to give interviews all day long. He's got like an office of people who do all the kind of work and he just goes on telly a lot. So to go around and get the interview was very, very easy. And we did our straight interview with him, which is the one you saw at the start where he's sitting down and like, stroking his dog. Um, and, and so we did that and he gave his straight Max Clifford interview, which is the one he gives everyone. I mean, I'd read so much about him and seen all the other interviews, I could literally predict exactly what he was going to say. And then we shut the camera cases and my cameraman made a big song and dance of putting everything away. Because I was still wearing the uh, secret camera. And, and we knew he'd do this because other people had said to us, Max will always say one thing on camera, that off camera he'll come out with all this outrageous stuff that he, he's, he's almost like he's taunting you with. You know, saying, ah, here's the stuff I didn't tell you. So that's why I knew that um, yeah, the secret camera was working. And he wouldn't shut up. I mean, people say, what did you say to get all that information out of it? I mean, literally, just, just started coming out with it. And after about an hour, and I was just like, I want to get out of here now. I'm just adrenaline out, and I'm terrified. And he just wouldn't, just wouldn't shut up. Um, so and we, we, we cut the scene together. And interestingly, no news organization would touch this. While The Guardian, all, all over the fake stories and the medical records, as you said, two front pages, it was amazing. No one wanted to screw with Max. Okay, that's how much fear he instills in the media. Um, so we thought, well, fuck it, we've got enough publicity for the film anyway. Uh, people want to come and see it. Loads of journalists are going to come to this press screening. Um, so, you know, let, let, let's leave Max a little surprise. You know, <laughs> let's have Max like the little sting at the end. So people think, oh, well, we know all the stuff about this film. It's like, you know. Um, so but our lawyers said, you've got to notify Max. You've got to give him a few hours notice because that is really the done thing. And if it ever goes to court, the fact that you didn't notify him will stand against you. So you've got to give free notification. So we, I wrote this letter. I had to sit and write a letter to Max Clifford Go, dear Max, sit down. You're not going to like this very much, but I've still got another double camera. Um, and put in a, and, but crucially, we said to him, don't worry, we beeped out all these names. So you know who they are, we know who they are, but no one else is going to know. So that's safe, but you're still going to look like a tit. Sorry. Um, so wrote all this out, went to his office, his big office in Mayfair, went and sort of pushed it to the letterbox, <laughs> and like rang the door, but I like ran away. Um, and, uh, and then the next morning, I'll never forget it, I have got to go on, on the computer server, at like 8 a.m. the next morning, I got this email from Carter Ruck. Don't know if any, any of you have ever heard Carter Ruck. The, the, yeah, yeah, the law firm that two weeks earlier tried to injunct Parliament, okay, that's, that's how mental these guys are. And uh, Max had called them in. And crucially, Simon Cowell as well had to get involved because he, met, he talked about Simon Cowell and we left that in. So Simon Cowell got a call from Max like at midnight, apparently, which can't have been a very good call. Going, oh, hi, it's uh, the person who's supposed to stop bad news going out about you. Uh, well, I've just shot my mouth off to some undercover journalists and mentioned you. Um, so that's why they got Cowell in. He basically, they said they were going to injunct us and they'd have probably gone for the super injunction, which means you can't tell anyone you've got an injunction. But they unfortunately didn't read the letter I sent them very carefully because I said to them that the press screen is at 9.30 tomorrow. So I said the press screen is at 9.30 tomorrow. And they assumed that was 9.30 in the evening. Anyone who knows anything about media knows that the press screens are always 9.30 in the morning so they can get the reviews out for the afternoon. So they started firing us these letters back and we started firing letters back to them. And all the time there was literally 200 journalists watching this film in Leicester Square at the press screening. They'd all turned up to see if they were in it because they knew about all the other stuff to do with journalists. <laughs> Normally you get about 10 people at a press screening, we had 200. <laughs> Hacks, I see if they're in it or not. Um, and, uh, and so by the time the press screening finished, the, uh, it, everyone knew. 
the entire, all the world's media knew that Max had been stung in the film. So we kind of then had to say to them, look, not being funny, but there's no point getting injunction now because the cat's out of the bag. And uh, all, all these hacks know about it, so it went away. Um, but interestingly, I was called up by Sky News and Channel 4 News. Both wanted to do a piece on this. And we said, yeah, yeah, more publicity. Yeah, come along. Um, and then, like, the next day when they were supposed to come to the interview, they both said, ah, you know what? Uh, don't think, uh, don't think, we've uh, got some better stories. Sorry, sorry. And I found out from someone at Sky News, so I know, that basically Dead called up Max to say, we're doing a story on you being stung. We can want to come interview you, <laughs> you know, get your comment. And he said, you will never, ever get me again. And crucially, you'll never get any of my clients again. Seeing his clients, people like Simon Carroll and A-list movie stars, all the news organisations backed off, which kind of proves our point that you can shut down stories because you shut down our story. Anyway, it was, it was, it was, you know, it was a lot of fun. Uh, that's my co-producer, Victoria Hollingsworth, who was, she was freaking out a bit as well, actually, because she thought he could see my camera. And it's a terrible thing when you're doing undercover work, because as soon as you start thinking, oh, you can see my camera, basically anything they do gives you more and more evidence to think that they can see your camera. You just get this vicious mental cycle. It's a real, it's almost a head fuck, but it's a real head fuck. So she had gotten that, and she said afterwards, she, she just wanted to run out the door screaming, but she just kept thinking you could see my camera see the camera. So, um, yeah. And how did you source funding for it? How do I source funding for it? With extreme difficulty. Um, the problem is, this is how I equate it. Um, well, we're making a film that was really, really, really going to attack the media. And I've got stuff in the film about Richard Curtis, Harvey Weinstein. I mean, people in the movie business. You know, I had logos put in of, like, Disney and... Miramax and all these companies. I basically wanted to screw everybody. That was the thing. And I thought it wouldn't be fair and it would be really, it would destroy the message if I said, oh, I'm going to have a go at all these media companies. Oh, except this one because they might be funding them. Or except this one because they might distribute my film. So we had to say we're going to basically fuck over everyone <laughs> in order to be fair about it. Um, but the problem with that was is that we were then going into the very same media companies film companies to say, will you give us half a million quid to fund a film that basically is going to hang you out to dry? It wasn't a good pitch, let me put it this way. Um, and we, we had this whole section in about Disney and how Disney uses very clever marketing to trick children and how that has led to a rise in narcissism and has been linked to increased cases of mental illness. Okay, so you're going to Miramax. And Miramax normally would love this kind of film. Miramax did... Fahrenheit 9-11, that'd be a great home for it. I know those guys. But Miramax is owned by Disney. So you're sitting there under this massive Mickey Mouse sign, pitching this guy something that basically calls him a crook. You know, and amazingly, they, uh, they all said no. Um, so in the end, it took us about, I'd say it took us about two and a half years to do it. We kind of self-funded. We, uh, me and my producers all sort of had other jobs. So I work in advertising and we go and do adverts. I really did some short films for working title. They're owned by Universal, who we also criticised the film, but they didn't know at the time. So, yeah, they, uh, yeah, we just did other work and other jobs. Lots of people worked on it for nothing. Lots of people worked on the film on the condition that I wouldn't name them the credits, which is like the first time it's ever happened in a movie. Normally everyone's like, where's my credits? I want my credit. I want a big, big credit. And lots of people helped me on this and said, I'm only going to help you if you never tell anyone that I help you because I'll never work again. So, we, but we had lots of quite influential people behind the scenes kind of doing stuff for it. And our lawyers were great. I mean, mainly. <laughs> well, we do have very, very, very short credits, but when the film went out on telly, and I have this, the right to replies were so long. If you, I don't even saw it on telly, but just if you ever see it again on more four, you don't have to watch the whole film again, just go to the credits at the end. And it's like the right to replies, which is, you know, the news of the world, the sun, the mirror, Bob Geldof, Max Clifford. I mean, literally, the right to replies of, we deny what this guy said about us, or no comment. Just, they just, literally, the right to replies go on and on. So, yeah, that, that was quite easy. Yeah, what are you working on now? I saw you doing something um, on the other website in regards to journalism. Journalism, yeah. I wish I could show you the clip now, but I, I, I didn't read it. But the guy coming next week will show you. Basically, I was approached by the Media Standards Trust, who are like a charity, and they asked me, they've got this website, for journalism, which will show you what uh, news articles are sourced directly from press releases. 
Um, and they said, how are we going to get coverage for this? And I said, well, with difficulty, because no newspaper is going to write about something that shows how bad their newspaper is. So I said, ah, oh, but if you do a stunt and you do something silly, then you hope, will hopefully get some attention. So I spent two weeks in the night of Valentine's Day sending out fake press releases um, for some really crazy stuff. I invented the chastity garter. So some of you may have even read. More, and more people have heard about the chastity garter from the news that went out than the news that it was a hoax. Okay. The chastity garter sits on a, on a lady's thigh. But it's got a microchip in. And if she's being sexually aroused, it sends a text to her husband or boyfriend to say that she's being unfaithful. And I thought the, the trick with all this stuff is, is, is latch onto a narrative, always latch onto a narrative. So if you see that every day the newspapers are writing about the same thing over and over and over again, it means that they're desperate for news stories about that thing. So that, with this narrative, I thought gypsies. Okay, everyone's writing about gypsies. I was at a dinner party with some journalists and what they were saying, like every day their editors come to them and say, I need a new gypsy story. I need to just tell me, give, some, give me some more news on gypsies. So I said in this press release that the Chastity Garter was particularly popular amongst premiership footballers and gypsies. Um, straight on the Mail's website, massive, all the text, cut and pasted from the press release. I also got a very good looking sort of dancer that I know who looks like a gypsy to model it. So I sent them a photo, oh, a photo of a good looking girl, straight on the Mail website. That went around the world. It's been translated into like eight languages, that article. Like I've seen it in Hebrew. Um, it's been to like all, in like about, 30 odd countries, Times of India again, and ended up on, uh, on national news, like uh, uh, breakfast TV news in America. So, yeah, we did lots of stuff like that. I did something about the fake cat, uh, not the fake cat, uh, uh, the cat, Larry the cat, the new Downing Street cat. You, you know, he came from uh, uh, Bats and Cat's home. Oh, but where did he come before that? He was a stray. So I set up a Facebook group going, that's not Larry, that's Joe. That cat belongs to my aunt. Uh, and I got a mate of mine who's really good at Photoshop to basically take a cat on the internet and make it look just like Larry the Cat. And we put that up on the Facebook group, and that was on the Mail website literally within an hour of setting up the Facebook group. And then it was on the BBC News, and oh, anyway, it went everywhere. So, yeah. Um, so, yes, that was that was all to promote journalism. However, there's one other news stunt I did, which I think we've got just enough time for, um, which is about foxes. Do you see stuff about foxes? This is by far the city. And this almost got me killed as well. Like, I've, I've never had, I didn't, I didn't actually get death threats doing Star Trek, so I got death threats from Fox. Right. So this should, oh, it should be self explanatory. The idea first came to us when we saw the sensationalist report of the fox attack on the twins in Hatton in June. For the weeks afterwards, any story involving a fox would be given massive prominence, no matter how ridiculous. The media coverage successfully demonised the animal, even through the choice of pictures. With some in government pushing to repeal the hunting act, it seemed that this media hysteria might shift public opinion against the bad. So Johnny and I decided to make a film to show people what it's like to actually hunt and kill a fox. But we wanted to make it as silly as possible, to show that the press will print literally anything to do with foxes. On the first night, we went out to see if I could film Johnny in the same shot as a fox. It went badly almost immediately, when a fox ran off with most of our bait. Is that your bag? We were left with a tin of dog food, which Johnny laid out on the ground and then pretended to lace with the powerful sedative Xanax. A fox soon came by and we got our shot of him eating the dog food. He then went about his business while Johnny pretended to chase him. The following week, we persuaded several of our friends to join us do not wish to be identified. I also borrowed Monty, as he looks remarkably similar to a fox. Can we see what you look like with the mask and the hat? Right. <laughs> 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 
say that it's one of those things that just was like far too successful because we we didn't realize we should have realized exactly how angry the animal rights community was going to get bear in mind hunt saboteurs you know they've been known to like dig up people's dead grandmothers and we were sitting there going oh shit we just really pissed them off um and johnny who made the film with me he lives up near victoria park and he got off a bus going home and there was someone with a flyer handing him a flyer going have you seen this man and it was his face <laughs> on the flyer that he was given i mean with the mask and everything but he was trying to go mate we've got we're, we're in deep trouble now <laughs> and the rspca and another charity put out a two thousand pound reward for our unmasking and a couple of my mates who i spoke to about this were like i'm a bit skint actually i might uh, <laughs> i might just dob you in um so we had to kind of come out and go hands up this is why we did it and and I mean, really, it was over a hundred emails and messages saying we're going to kill you. It wasn't just a couple of death threats; it was over a hundred death threats, and we were really scared. But once people sort of saw what we'd done and why we'd done it, nothing, absolutely nothing. And so, you know, we were sort of like Phew, um, after that one. But um, I think if you hoax for the sake of hoaxing, it upsets people. But if you do it with a kind of purpose and a reasoning for it that you can then hold your hands up and explain yourself, then people do seem to engage with it. So. Yeah, if anyone's got any great ideas, just send them over. Anyone any questions about that? Yeah. Do you think that, especially the tabloids, they actually know that all these are fake? 
the quote from it, and they sort of get the joke almost that they know. Like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I know. I think it's the public that's the loser. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, no, they, they know they're bashing this stuff out. Isn't true. There's a really good letter um, that's just been published by the Guardian by Daily Star journalist. He's just resigned. The, the, the Pepe out affair. I can't go into too much detail, but I had a minor hand in that. Um, and uh, it, it was great because he just says, "I made it up." I made, in fact, the phrase he uses, I plucked it from my ass um, when he was staring at a blank page. So it's almost like moved beyond hoaxing now because it's like, well, they hoax themselves. They're sitting there going, that's true, boring. This is, let's just make up something fantastical. It's always about who's going to sue and not sue. So you don't see them making up stories about Kate Moss. She's a real sewer. Never about Jonathan Ross. You'll have shillings on your case in seconds. Kelly Brook doesn't sue. So therefore, you can make stuff up about Kelly Brooks. You just can't be our suing. So that's why they make up stories about her, not about Kate Moss. So make, make your notes. But um, yes. So uh, so yeah. I, I, absolutely. As Rich's letter showed, if you haven't, go to the Guardian and just Google a Daily Star reporter. It, it was trending worldwide at one point. It was magnificent. But yeah, he quit basically from the Daily Star, saying, "A, your racist paper is supporting the EDL, and B." I just couldn't handle being ordered to make up stories anymore. And he lists all the stories that he made up. It's absolutely priceless. So, yeah, they, they, they know it. They know they're doing it. So. Uh, yeah, they said he wasn't a staff reporter, uh, even though he has not, uh, 850 bylines with them. Um, uh, and he's got, I've actually got one of his business cards. But yes, yes, he, he has a business card, but he doesn't apparently work there. Um, and it says, this paper does not endorse the EDL. And if you look at their, those two front pages they did, they bloody do endorse the EPL. If you look at the star says, it endorses the EPL. So they're just liars, basically. Yeah? Oh, you just stretch Anyone else? Yeah? Is there any chance that they're, um, especially after being exposed like this, they're not going to change their ways, they have no moral need to do so? Are they, how, how much damage is it? I mean, it's, it's a very good point. You don't, you, you don't know until you do it. That's the thing. I, when I was first doing the first set of hoaxes for, for, uh, with the fake celebrity stuff, I was talking to a journalist about it and said, you know, do you have any qualms about me screwing over other journalists? And she said, well, no, because when she first started at a newspaper, the very first thing she was told, whenever that phone rings, assume it's Chris Morris and you won't go far wrong. So I like to think that there's going to be sometimes stuff's going to happen and someone's going to go, oh, hang on, is this another one of these hoaxes? And to be fair, some, some newspapers didn't print our stuff. We, we only put in the stuff that's successful. We did quite a bit of stuff that didn't get picked up. So it's not like every journalist immediately falls to this stuff. A lot don't, which is a very good thing. It's like every time a journalist goes, nah, puts the phone down, we're like, oh, that's good. You know? So the one thing journalists hate is being named and shaped. They love to just sit in the shadows, write their piece, get their fee, cash in their expense check. As soon as you start naming, as soon as you start shining a light on and naming them, they get very, very sort of defensive indeed. And if being defensive means they start checking facts and, and not running bullshit, then hallelujah. But to, to be honest with you, I don't know. You, you never know with these things. Yeah? Obviously, like you said, you were upset in very powerful people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you worry that your career was yeah, yeah, I did, and in a way it has. I mean, that career did, but I wasn't really into making those kind of movies anymore. I didn't really want to work with those kind of people. I mean, people have said to me, Harvey, you will never work with Harvey Weinstein again after I put him in the film, twice. Uh, and I was like, I don't want to work with Harvey Weinstein. He's a prick, okay? I don't, I don't want to work for him, you know? It's like, you don't want to work for Working Title again. I'm like, great, they make terrible films. I don't want to make any more terrible films than Working Title. Brilliant. So it's almost like sort of self-cleansing the number of people I don't want to work with again. Because I, ha I have worked with these people before. I just don't want to again. So, yeah, in a way, it's good. It's like really shutting the door firmly. Um, and this stuff's much more fun than making movies. Trust me. Yeah, you're doing this bit of this No, I, see, I'm, I'm a, to be honest with you, I'm a bit hoaxed out, I have to say. So I did, yeah, I did the stuff in Star Suckers, and then I did the Fox thing, because it was funny. And then I did the journalism thing, because it was for a good cause. It was the thing. And now I'm like, oh, God, am I known as the hoax guy now? So... Uh, I, I think I am known as hoax guy, so I, I am working on deliberately non hoaxy stuff. And maybe when I try and pitch that to people, everyone's going to go, oh, is this a hoax? So I might have shot myself in the foot, but no, hopefully no more hoaxes for a while. And that's a really good one that comes along. What, what 
is your next project at university? Um, the really cool stuff I can never talk about because it's like it'll just be announcing it and then it'll be over because people know about it. Um, I am actually, and this was this was supposed to not be known, but um, I, I am I am writing a sitcom about life in the tabloid newsroom, so that is known about. It was on Popwitch the other day. God knows how they found out, but yeah. So that's kind of out in the open. So yes, I'm, I've written a sitcom about life in the tabloid newsroom that hopefully will be on television in the not too distant future. So that's the one thing I'm allowed to talk about. So. Right. Um, I think everyone. Um, thank you I've been doing this a long time, Chris, and this has been one of the most interesting, entertaining, fun, serious, fantastic presentations I've seen beautifully illustrated with incredibly well-produced cinema clips. I've learned and enjoyed this incredibly. It's been extremely well presented. Students and members of the public, fantastic questions. You've drawn the best out of Chris. What a great night. We've enjoyed it. Let's thank. Thank you.